Laotian Americans. Are you Chinese or Japanese? <laughs> yeah, so this is, um, I mean, on the right there, you have like the Sinponusen family that moves into the neighborhood of the, the hills and, uh, and and the other characters. And it, it sort of played for, for laughs in many ways where they're, um, well, the, the, the Sinponusen family, they're quite unpleasant. And they, you know, they try the hills and the gribbles, like they try to welcome them in, but there's a lot of friction between them. Not only because they're Asian, but also because they're, um, let's say that they're more white collar. Uh, what was his name? Khan Simpanusen. And they're Californian the, yeah. as well. Yes, yes, certainly. <laughs> they, and Khan Simpanusen, I think he has like a job of like a systems analyst is the description, but he's, he's basically some kind of like software tech job uh, where he makes a lot of money. I'm not sure what Min does. Um, of course, they have like a single uh, kid there as well. Uh of course, the, the the friction between between them and the hills, you know, it creates a lot of uh, storylines. Even though they're able to reconcile, because uh, because of the kids, basically. So there is like this kind of plot where there, there's a sort of romance developing between Bobby and um, the daughter here. So it, I mean, she's nicknamed Connie, but her name is actually Con Junior for some reason. Of course, when Joseph gets a little bit older, this turns into like this kind of triangle uh, triangle drama that. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's it's sort of a relief for Hank Hill because there, it's sort of implied that he expects that Bobby is gay, right? When he <laughs> when they figure out that he when he learns that uh, yeah, he's trying like to sort him. of uh, swoon yeah. uh, Connie, then he's he's kind of relieved a little bit. But one of the things that I think is interesting about you know the the Laotians here, you know, because I mean I didn't know that much about Laos prior to this show. I'd sort of heard the word heard heard about the country previously in relation to tourism but it is like this much smaller uh, asian country with about seven million immigrants that i think was a part of like sam previously and um it was taken over by a, a communist party in the 1950s and, and it sort of ran as a communist country until 1975 and it's still sort of a one-party state a little bit like china where it's like it's, it's still sort of the people from the communist party who run the country but they've gone a lot mm -hmm. more moderate in terms of their policies in allowing more free trade and uh you know policies that are more let's say friendly to the to the kind of global american world order yeah yeah but like the reason I bring that up is because I feel like there is uh, such an amount of deracination with these characters. And it's it's something that actually creates storylines in the show as well, where you talk about like the deracination of the Texans who live there and, and the people who are just interested in NASCAR and watching television and, and just going to work and getting a hammer on the weekend and stuff. But it, like the the Saint Panusen family really just have no connection to their homeland whatsoever, and they're only interested in consumer lifestyles, uh, watching reality television, you know, buying a, a bigger house, getting a bigger car. Like there's a there's a plot where he, you know, builds a, a pool in his yard. Like it, it's really shown that they they are incredibly kind of like shallow, you know, mean spirited characters, in a sense. But that's where like the 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 family on the left here, that's the Wasanason family comes in and uh, ted was on that's the um that's the sort inside of bald uh, character with the glasses hair is he is a recurring character almost like a type of villain where i realized that he's probably mm -hmm. one of the most hated characters by the fan community but like his his storyline is that he is also laotian but he's much more interested in like the the goings on in in laos than than um khan and there's like this plot where he basically tries to recruit Khan to fight in the resistance army to overthrow the communist government in Laos, <laughs> which is where they bring in like this topic of uh, like no, the, not the topic but the term like banana, basically like the Asian banana that is uh, yellow on the outside and white on the inside, right. and, and trying to use that as a kind of slur for the kind of deracinated uh, Asians. So, I mean, in in spite of like the Vasanasan characters being kind of playing a villain role and being hated, I think that he's like you know accidentally kind of based in a sense where he he had to you know leave laos because he didn't like the the situation but he he's just trying to use uh you know america as a kind of opportunity to build a new community and to gather resources so he can assemble a kind of laotian community to send back and overthrow the government right he's also uh seems to have more money than khan 
Is that correct? Yes. Like that's I mean, he, a point he is, uh, is... He, he is a little bit older and he actually knows how to handle money right? because it's shown that Khan is basically like this uh, compulsive consumer spender. Like he just, he blows yeah. all the money on crap as, as soon as he gets it. Whereas the, um, the Wasana Sons is much better at investing, uh, you know, doing this, this kind of property investment. I think even his uh, design is based on some Chinese uh, famous property investor, although I don't remember his name uh, in particular. So there's also these subplots that go on with uh, with like this kind of country club that they have uh, that, that's pictured down in the right corner where Khan keeps trying to get into this country club, but he, he's just always rejected yeah. until he actually tries to recruit uh, Hank as like this honorary white <laughs> honorary <laughs> white uh, member. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of stuff going on there. Uh, they have a son as well that's that plays a bit of a, a bully in um, in the show. So. I don't know, Jay. Do you have any? What What did you think of these characters? Uh, I think one of the things that's this is another kind of like thing you couldn't be or you couldn't do in a show is I was actually surprised because I hadn't really watched the early episodes of the show again since I became kind of more politically aware, and I was kind of expecting them to be the kind of like idyllic American immigrant family, you know, and to be painted with this like you know, extremely like soft touch. And I was surprised at how like, <laughs> especially Cotton and his wife are just genuinely dislikable people. And I, I think that that is, you know, not something you could really get away with in modern America. I, I, they're not like my favorite characters. I mean, I find them irritating. I also think that's like admittedly kind of the point, but I, I did think that was interesting because you really couldn't have immigrants portrayed negatively, I think in like a post Trump world. And I'm, I'm using that term because the people who write the think pieces would use that term, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like, I don't have, you know, much particularly insightful to say, but it is just interesting to see a, you know, a show where you can still actually like examine the genuine problems of kind of like outsider groups, you know, coming into kind of a, you know, a, a specific local culture. Yes. And, you know, I, I do think it's interesting how they show that they, they form, you know, these kind of in-group, uh, quote unquote, mafias, right? And, that, and I mean, it's very typical for American immigrant groups. Um, we know that where it's like the uh, the founding stock just, has just kind of remained and become deracinated, live live as more as individuals, and they just kind of run from, you know, they they sort of do white flight if if things get a little bit too too heavy. But uh, the immigrant groups always organize themselves into like these kind of fraternities, brotherhoods, uh, you know, through through industry and getting into like the same types of jobs and so on. Uh, I mean, do you have a lot of yep. that going on in Virginia? Like Less so in my area, but actually one of the reasons that my state, which was a kind of a conservative heartland for a long time, like it's where, you know, figures like Jerry Falwell were from and it was solidly red for a very long time, but because it kind of like butts up against you know, the, what is referred to as Nova or Northern Virginia, which is like the DC sprawl. It is, it is flipped blue. And a big part of that is essentially one, just like regular generic American, like laptop go anywhere class. And the other part is that there's been a massive amount of immigration, right? So even Paul Fahrenheit, who lives in that area, he always talks about like this area essentially exists as like a, like a high class Indian colony. You know, that they're essentially like upper caste Indians everywhere, like a lot of like, you know, well-educated, you know, Asians of all varieties. And so that is less so in my area because I'm about, you know, 200 miles south of there. But it is it is something that has affected my state to such a degree that my state is, even though we have a, you know, a Republican controlled governor now, is a reliable blue state, you know, largely because of people like Khan. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, it's that's a weird thing that usually, you know, the immigrants, they, they seem to talk conservative, but vote, vote liberal all the time. It's very strange. Like yeah, they I live know. and talk conservative, but they vote liberal. And I think part of that is that they're, they still are plugged into the Gibbs system, you know, less so with, with kind of like Southeast Asians. And we may see that switch, but yeah. I think that and this is a, a kind of a rank a racial stereotype, but like being so focused on like social acceptability and kind of like, uh, 
you know, doing the kind of like socially acceptable thing, being very like outwardly image focused, being left wing is seen as like high class and civilized. Uh, And so obviously there are distinct minorities, like the particularly the Korean population in the U.S. is particularly conservative. Again, going back to the Rodney King riots, Mm -hmm. but also uh, like I, I live near a very large like evangelical college and there's a shocking amount of you know, Koreans there. But I think that we, other groups are much, much more likely to be swayed by like the, I guess the like socially acceptable thing to do. And fair enough, that may change, you know, as we see kind of like political alliances shift in the U S but, but I mean, you, you see it sort of even in the Rodney King stuff. I mean, the, oh, the, yeah. the, Korean immigrant is forced to take a position about whether or not he's going to have to, to, to shoot at black people just because he lives in America. Right. Right. And, and um, it's, again, it's difficult. So I, I agree with you. And I think that at least until now, and we're kind of starting to see as the progressive coalition coalition, excuse me, is fracturing in the U S these different like client groups are starting to run up against each other. So that yes, may... it's it's kind of what Moldbug is talking about when he's saying that it's about what's cool, you know, that mm-hmm. what's cool is sort of shifting. So we'll see, but at least for now, they are, despite being, you know, allegedly very socially conservative. And actually, now that I think about it, maybe another part of this is that they, there are different in-group and out-group rules, you know, and so we're kind of like one one rule for the in-group a different rule for the out group that I think is very oh, yeah, definitely. kind of like minority groups in the West. No. Yeah. I, I had uh, where I live, there is a, well, I say sizable, it's not very sizable, but considering like percentages, it's a sizable Vietnamese population that you wouldn't know it until you walk by the Catholic church on, on a Saturday, then suddenly, you know, that's every Vietnamese person in like a two, two hour drives area. Um, and, I, so I, I had a couple of uh, Vietnamese friends growing up and it, it, I got to see it like firsthand how different, you know, life is within and without uh, inside and outside of the home. Right. Right. To, to the point where they would have, you know, they would have names that were intended for us. Like they would have one outside name and one family name. Like what they like, I'd be, be visiting my a Vietnamese friend and like his mom would call him something else, right? Because that's that the name he used outside to the foreigners, right? Well, that's actually pretty common. So one of the biggest plagues of modern education currently is uh, rich Chinese students, because in the way that university works in the U.S. is that it is there are kind of two systems. There are state schools and private schools. So the state schools are funded by state governments. And they are required to let in a certain percentage varies where you live of people who live in that state. And if you're outside of the state, you don't receive uh, subsidized tuition. Your tuition is generally about three times as expensive. Right. And so the, the schools have this massive incentive to bring those kids in because they bring in a lot of money. And so there's continually problems where essentially like out of state students are being let in at a greater rate than they're supposed to be, right? You can obviously see that the game theory problem. Now that is even more so the case with international students and specifically with China, because there are a lot of exceptionally, you know, wealthy Chinese kids who want a, you know, American education, you know, for whatever that's worth, apparently it still has some cachet in Eastern uh, Asia. Probably has some, uh, some carry some weight in back in China. Right, exactly. And so they, they come over. And so for instance, I went to a, like a higher end state school, you know, like my program was top 20 in the nation, which is an incredible, but like on the upper end of state schools. And there were the kind of like, you know, like shitty student ghettos, you know, where you paid too much money for a crappy apartment. And then there was like a Chinese area and they had essentially bought what would have been like family homes, which were very expensive, you know, cause they were all brand new. And they were all owned by Chinese students and they would, they were driving cars to school that were, you know, $300,000, $400,000, you know, brand new supercars, you know, yeah, while your yeah. students are there and they're like shitty Honda Civics. But the funny thing about them is when the, stu- when the teachers called roll, it would be, you know, a Chinese name. And then the kid would stand up and in not particularly good English say like, yeah, just call me Paul, 
or call me Tom, you know, Actually, like very yeah. generic names. And that, so I think that's a pretty common practice. Yeah, I've heard about similar things and I can confirm that uh, the stuff about like the Vietnamese and the Koreans where they have like uh, different names for you uh, inside and outside of the group and different names for themselves and even stuff that they talk about where they do have the awareness that, you know, certain topics that you don't bring up to the out group, right? Or certain things you don't ask about. I mean, say, say for, for instance, like with the Japanese, they have this thing with uh, with like blood type, for instance, and age where it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, common for them if they meet someone who's Japanese, they'll ask about, you know, like your age, where you came from and your blood type. And it's, it's considered completely normal, but they'll never ask that to a Westerner, at least not in my, uh, my experience. Yeah, they're very conscious of the faux pas. Let's see her glow in the dark for another $5. Thank you so much. Most immigrants want to be seen as acceptable by those in charge, so they will vote liberal lest they control almost everything. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very, yeah. very simple way of viewing at it. And I, I do agree that that's part of it. It's just a very interesting phenomenon that it just seems to happen all the time. Uh, how how sort of uh, coordinated they seem in it. Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, you know, how much do they have to gain from voting Republican, right? Uh, I mean, they're able to sort of maintain their own local communities where they have their in-group rules and they can maintain a certain conservatism there regardless of how, like, degenerate the actual policies are because they just have parallel... Exactly, they can they just, they just their, with, own, yeah. uh, their own local community and then vote for more Gibbs, so why why not? Yeah, exactly. So, but, but of course, there there will be some breakage in these communities. Like I saw something that was posted on Clausington's uh, Telegram for, for some a couple of weeks back. That uh, it's like this black influencer who was on uh, his name was Charleston White or something. He was on the Say Cheese YouTube channel, and he was talking about like this, uh, you know, diamonds and jewelry. Where I I wasn't aware of this, but there's like this. Um, famous Vietnamese guy, it's called Johnny Dang, right? And he sells like this jewelry to a lot of these black rappers and so on. And, and like Charleston was just basically talking about how like Asian people are fucking trash and, and like they're just exploiting black people and like they should be able to find, you know, other black jewelers and people they can buy gold from because, uh, you, you know, like Asian people have just, they just come to America to rip black people off, right? It, it's kind of like this Kanye <laughs> mindset. I mean, I, I, uh, looking at the statistics, if you're an Asian person selling to black people, I would be careful. <laughs> um, I'm not touching that one, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, I mean, the relations between some of these client groups, I mean, it's it's not hot, right? And I realize that it's never been particularly attractive. Like if you're an Asian person, you set up a store in some, some black neighborhood, the uh, it, I mean, it, I guess it is a little bit like it is in that that Wayne's Brothers movie from the '90s, uh, "Don't Be a Menace." I don't know if you've seen it. The um, it's a, it's like one oh, of these I'm, kind of game show comedies, but you could just uh, you could just uh, search for it on YouTube where they have the the clips where they like they. But, I mean, uh, the weird thing here is that that's the norm. I mean, historically, right? If some foreign guy, you know, sets up a shop in your village, you run him out, right? Yeah, well, you typically that's the norm. You, you... I mean, that's why uh, the meme. What what is it? How many nations is it? One hundred and twenty nine. I think it's one hundred and nine. Right. Yeah, one hundred and nine. Okay, yeah. But I mean, of course, is the, if the shop is like really useful to whatever uh, geopolitical strategy the uh, the elite have, then you know it, it changes things. But from like the local populist perspective, it's always just run yeah, out. That's what I'm saying. Of, you know, uh, if an Asian guy sets they up want. a jewelry shop in a black neighborhood, he's going to get run out. Yeah, but I mean, in that uh, that say cheese interview, like Charleston, he he talked about a lot of the inner workings of like the the black community in the United States, and it, it's something that's quite fascinating to me because you look at them from the outside and they seem, uh, you know, somewhat coherent. But there's a lot of incoherency inside of the community where they sort of, like, a, a lot of them are apparently you know suspicious of their of their own kind, right? It's, it's sort of if you're you're black in the United States, if if you want to let's say like get the cosign for a for a mortgage or or something else like you should always bring a white person like they, they basically look at you know buying stuff from white people or for asians it's like a higher level of trust or quality because if you like the stuff you buy from other black people it's it's always considered to be like low low class or um to, to, to be something of low quality i mean I, I wasn't aware that they had you know this was sort of an internal logic within that community but um you know the more, the more you learn the bucket, right? 
Well, and I don't, obviously I don't know very much about the, you know, the black community really at all, but I, I kind of have seen that on, on the back end, you know, working and kind of like selling because I've, I've bought and sold a lot of cars, you know, just as a hobby. And it was, it was always odd because like it was a, it was very clear that when like a, like I, if I sold a car to a, to a black guy, which I did like once or twice, very carefully, uh, it, it was very, it was very clear that like he saw me and he was like, oh, like this is a, this is like a high status, like high class thing. And I'm like, I, it is, you know, and, and I didn't know that, but re- realizing that that actually makes sense. Cause that kind of explained a, like a few social interactions I've had but that actually makes sense. That's yeah. the fun thing about working like any place where you sell something because you clearly pick up on like racial dynamics and uh, how that stuff works. Like if if like an Iranian guy comes into your store, you can. I mean, for me, it was selling like tech stuff for a couple of years while I was uh, studying. And uh, if the Iranians ever came into the store, I knew that they were wealthy because any Iranian who made it to Norway would have been from the, like the first wave back in the seventies, meaning that they were basically leftists and academics with a lot of money, right. Who had made it well here in Norway. So if an Iranian guy came into my store, I just make sure that they got good service because they always came back and spent a lot more money. <laughs> it's, it's those those things you learn when you're like working behind the counter somewhere like when as you said like oh it's a black guy coming in he's gonna he's gonna look at me with like this is gonna be a, a good deal well right and that was the that was one of the weird things it's like i would be i would be working and i'm like i'm not trying to talk to myself but i'm like a six foot tall like you know like pretty like white looking white guy right like i've got you know pretty pale skin i you know dress like a you know relatively conservative white guy and so when some like you know like bigger black guy would walk up to me like as his choice of salesman i was always like uh, excuse me are you here <laughs> like, do, do I, like, like no no offense like i'm happy to sell to you but do, 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 am i giving off some type of signal here <laughs> that's funny <laughs> because from sales I, I very much learned the same thing and like I, I and that's actually one of the other things to bring it back to this was something that mr patriarch was was talking about which is that like which like which nation or culture has you know the best salesman because and what i said is that i i think that you know there's a a tradition of kind of like the american honest deal that i have not seen in other cultures specifically like i've had the displeasure of buying and selling with some uh nigerians which i i did not oh yeah very, yeah very yeah. scummy but to me that's something else that i see in in kind of like King of the Hill, you know, is that idea that like Hank Hill is a salesman, you know, and it's kind of like played as a joke that he loves, you know, being a propane salesman. But I, I don't know, to me, that, that idea that like being a salesman is not like a dishonest thing, that it is like an honest profession. You know, I think that is a very like American well, the, idea. The European, or I suppose the, no, it's the European. And of course the Anglo, therefore American, is a lot more rigid on that. It is, you know, it, it bartering is the thing right and and uh it's very uncomfortable to travel somewhere where you have to haggle uh, where that's yeah, the norm for, for me as well i mean you don't have to go further than say like uh, southern europe like somewhere like italy and spain and like dealing with the salespeople there i hate it i hate it there's their uh you know there's like the, the haggling expectation and the like the dishonesty the bootlicking and so on that's um yeah I, I of course i prefer like the sort of hank heel style well and i Tell think me what the uh, price uh, is uh, yeah and i'll buy it if i want to <laughs> well right and even within like areas where there is like an expectation of making a deal it's always like there's no there's like a a, a bell curve of acceptable like over yeah. or under charging like i would never like it would be offensive to me if i were negotiating a contract and someone offered me like fifty percent of what I was felt like uh-huh. I was worth, or if I asked a hundred and fifty percent of what I thought was something was worth, you know, like that idea would be like that would end the deal. You'd be like, "Who do you think I am?" You know, and that does seem to be a very let's just say like Northern European attitude. And it's weird because when you think about Americans here, it's it's that version of America, right? That the image that we get, but it's also Donald Trump who would ask for the fifty percent. Right. Well, and that is a there. Those are two distinctly different cultures. 
you know, like that is he's oh, yeah, and I, probably I yeah. funny, but that is that is kind of like New York culture, which is very distinct from the kind of like, you know, Southern Southwest culture is seen of King of the Hill. And that's yeah, actually definitely. if we can, you know, return to the eternal, eternal, like uh, American question, make you, if you will, that that. While there are certain things that are distinctly like broadly American, there are very distinct subcultures. And that's actually one of them because when I was buying and selling cars, like working with that car collection, because it was so specialized, you know, we we met with clients from all over the US. And there was a distinctive difference in specifically how like and I hate to say it, but I I I didn't I didn't realize that that even what people who would have been called like the the quote unquote, like white ethnics, you know, 50, 60 years ago. So, you know, Polish, Italians, people like that. Right, were, right. Or like the Ellis Island coalition type. Like that is a very distinctly different culture from old stock Americans. And like mm-hmm. the idea of kind of like the shady used car salesman is like, you know, slicked back hair, you know, like hairy chest, you know, kind of creepy looking. Like that is essentially a stereotype about like uh, Polish and Italian immigrants. You know, and like, it's not nice right. to say that is a, that is a, fi- a figure in American culture who's kind of been de-racialized as, as yeah, gay. Yeah, yeah. I see that what you're is. saying. But that is a, that, that is a different, and not to say that, look, like Trump is white, old stock American, but you even see that he is kind of a class, class outcast, you know, like the other, like, oh yeah, yeah. Class New Yorkers don't like him. And some of that I think is. And, and that's the like, thing here with the, like. <sighs> I, that's why I like, I think it's AA who uses the word bio spirit because it allows for some wiggle room within, you know, it's, it's not just your DNA. It's also, you know, what, uh, Evola calls the, the metaphysics of race, right? That, you know, you can have a mind that is, you can have a body that is white and a mind that is uh, <laughs> Italian or, or, or black or Jewish, right? No, definitely. And I realize that this is, you know, this can be a controversial topic, but I, I think that that is. Oh, yeah, I doubt we would ever agree on it, but <laughs> that would be a, a a topic for a different time. 